please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Willie Parker. Thank you very, very much for that introduction. Sounds like the mic's not hot, but I don't need it. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. I'm from the South and uh, grew up in a church where there was no microphone system. And uh, the mantra was, if you had something worth saying, you should be able to project it. And if you couldn't, it wasn't worth hearing. <laughs> so uh, that was part and parcel to my training uh, as a public speaker, which started with Easter speeches during the pageants, like Easter here, Easter there, Easter, Easter everywhere. It's one of my <laughs> earlier speeches. So when people say, you know, you, uh, you have talents as a speaker, I think it all started right there. But I just want to say how grateful I am to be here and to have audience with you. I don't take lightly the forum that I've been afforded by having a book in the public domain and uh, as an advocacy tool and as a, a means of actualizing my values around trying to shape the context of the lives of people and to behave simply as if people matter, uh, in particular women, uh, and uh, to want for women what I want for myself, a life of dignity, well-meaning, purpose, and safety, and productivity. And so, um, it's only love if you want for other people what you want for yourself. And I love women. I love people. And so I'm grateful that as an act of love that I was able to write this book called Life's Work, A Moral Argument for Choice. I like to live gratefully. And part of that is always acknowledging people who have been critical along your path. Somebody for me who's, uh, who's had a longer witness of my trajectory than probably anybody in this room is... Uh, Debbie Bamberger, we started uh, working in the Central Valley of California back in 1994 in Merced. And she, as a nurse practitioner, I, as a newly minted OBGYN who was uh, not anti abortion, I simply wasn't pro reproductive rights yet. And so she was critical in my development. So, as uh, at the risk of embarrassing her, uh, uh, my, my gratitude is having people in my life who've been uh, critical along my path. Um, what I want to do uh, tonight is uh, share a few passages from my book as uh, fodder for uh, what I hope will flame into a conversation uh, around what I consider to be some of the critical issues of our day. Uh, when I wrote this book called Life's Work, A Moral Argument for Choice, it is not, as a person of faith uh, with a Christian identity, I was very intentional about not calling the book a religious argument for choice because uh, many are aware that uh, it is quite possible to achieve moral development without necessarily involving religion at all. And in fact, I'm counting on it because in some ways some of the more uh, pernicious things that have been done have been done in the name of religion. So I think there's something transcendent about uh, moral uh, thinking. And so uh, I concluded that the one stone that had been left unturned in our effort to advocate for uh, the rights of people who become pregnant to be self-determining and to decide when and whether or not and how often they should procreate is we've made the medical argument that it's incontrovertible that abortion is safe and saves lives of people who need them. We've even made the argument for humanity in terms of pushing back and rejecting the notion that there's something inhumane about abortion practice, i.e. Uh, uh, fetuses feel pain, and so it's, we are killing humans and causing pain and harm and suffering. But what we haven't made is the argument for uh, the innate right of uh, people to be self-governing over all the processes that occur in their bodies. And in particular, uh, the control of reproduction, since it's unique in that it occurs in the bodies of females. Uh, <clears throat> it is within their purview to control all processes going on in their body. So towards that end, I wrote this book. And I think as a kind of a, a lighter note of how to get into this, before I read passages, I saw a cartoon recently that explains what I think 
uh, I was trying to do with this book. So in this cartoon, there's a, a, a woman and a man having a conversation. And the man uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, says to the woman in the spirit of the conversation, I think they were talking about reproduction or at least where people came from. And so there's a balloon over her head where she responds to what he said. There's no balloon over his head, but you can infer what he must have said in, based on her response. So apparently the man had said to this woman in the course of this conversation, you came from my rib, intimating the creation story of Adam and Eve, Adam being placed in the sleep, his rib being taken, and then woman fashioned from that body part to intimate uh, male superiority and the primacy of masculinity. And anybody who studied embryology knows that that's biologically not plausible, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, so in response to this man exerting his male privilege over her, the woman says to him, I didn't come from your rib. You came from my vagina, <laughs> right? And isn't that the thrust of where we are today? We have a scientific understanding of reproduction. Babies come from vaginas. And a non-scientific, or at least in this case, a religious understanding about the significance of reproduction. And the two are important and they're valuable each in their own right, but what's most important is that they're not interchangeable. Or in other words, you can't answer a scientific question with religious answers. You can't answer religious questions with uh, scientific answers. And at the end of the day, the thing that we need to use in terms of crafting policy is evidence-based science, right? Because religious understandings don't, they're too subjective and too diverse. For example, my friend who's Jewish, his mother said with regard to viability, a Jewish uh, uh, fetus is not viable until it graduates from college and has a job, <laughs> right? right? So that just goes to show you subjectively, we cannot use religious understanding about reproduction and viability because it is too specific to the lived experience. But when we're talking about policies that we all, in a pluralistic country like this, the only thing where we stand equal, nobody has their own facts. Senior Dan Sen Sen uh, the late Senator Dan Sen Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who, with whom Almost everything he said I disagree with. I've prided myself on recognizing the truth when I hear it. And he said that everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but nobody's entitled to their own facts. And the facts of reproduction are that babies come from vaginas. <laughs> and the policy should be governed by that kind of information. So let me just dive in and say what I want to do is read three passages from the book. Uh, it'll take me a little time to do that, and then I want to leave plenty of time for dialogue and questions that I hope will be uh, generated from uh, some of the things that I'll share from the book. I'd like to start with a passage from the prologue. The, first, the book starts with a, the prologue, and it's called The Women. And I started uh, with that passage on purpose because for me, what this is all about is the women. And in this case, women who have unplanned, unwanted pregnancies or wanted, beliefly flawed ones. Because it's, we've politicized the issue of pregnancy, termination, and abortion uh, such that it is a health issue, it is a legal issue, it is a moral issue. And, but whatever it is, it's about something that is unique to the lived experience of women. And so there are those of us who think that we know who those women are who have abortions. And, one of the things I wanted to do was illuminate who the women are that I see and disabuse us of any notion that we can otherize people who have unintended pregnancies, given that now the frequency of unintended pregnancies is about one in four uh, by the time a woman's age 45 in this country. Not unintended pregnancies, the frequency of abortion. Unintended pregnancies where abortions come from, right? So unintended pregnancies happen far more frequently than abortions because of the unintended pregnancies that happen. Well over half people will continue a pregnancy even though they didn't intend to become pregnant in the first place. So I'm just going to read from, um, that it's called The Women. Their legs jiggle on the vinyl upholstery. They look into their laps. They get lost into their phones. On a single day in Montgomery between, say, the hours of 6.30 and noon, I will perform at least two dozen abortions and the women who come to me are of every race. Most range in age from about 19 to 40, but 
sometimes I see girls as young as 12, shocked and confused by their current circumstances and waiting with their mothers. The people who pass new laws concern themselves with fetuses, but these are the humans I'm caring for, real people, not merely biological organisms with the potential to become such. These individuals have full, messy, imperfect lives and hopes and dreams that will or won't come true. Aren't they entitled to be the authors of their own stories, to find their own victories and happinesses, to make their own mistakes without a Congress of legislators dictating what they must do? They are college students, married women, single mothers, and women without children. In a single morning, I might see a woman about to enter the Army, a first grade teacher, an x-ray technician, or a long-haired girl whose body is covered with tattoos, including one that says, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sometimes they use words like my boyfriend or my husband, and then sometimes they speak more euphemistically as in this person that I'm dealing with or <laughs> I don't usually have sex. But one act of sexual intercourse has brought these women here, but on the day of their abortion, the men, on their uh, the men are on the outskirts of their lives waiting for them in their SUVs or trucks that they keep idling in the parking lot or by the curb. This, the abortion clinic, is a woman's world. On the day of the procedure, I might do, I, I, on the day of the procedure, I do an ultrasound to determine the gestational age of the fetus. And when I ask the woman if she wants to see the image on the screen, as I'm required in Alabama by law to do, quite a few say yes. This impulse, I believe, is the opposite of heartless or morbid. The women who, to whom I provide this service are clear-eyed, and able to sort through all the different factors of their lives. They have the clarity they need and that I require of them before I will perform a procedure. But because they are human and not robots or, God, or gods, they will never have the total certitude that the antis demand of them. They have determined at this time what is right for them and their families. And in keeping with my ethical and Christian commitment not to make value judgment about individual women's choices, I do not interrogate them about the circumstances that brought them here, unless, of course, I sense that there is something illegal or unethical, like incest at play, or that a woman's being coerced. But if they ask me questions, as they frequently do, I answer them as their doctor, and not as their confessor or their friend, and I give them the medical truth. Before 22 weeks, a fetus is not in any way equal to a baby or to a child. It cannot survive outside the uterus because it cannot breathe, not even on a respirator. It cannot form anything like thoughts. Up until 29 completed gestational weeks, despite what the antis may say, the scientific consensus is that it cannot feel anything like pain. I tell women that having this abortion will not impede their future ability to have children, as, as many as they want, as long as their fertility persists. I do not engage in or perpetuate any of the culture's sentimental notions about the primacy of motherhood in a woman's life. I regard the meeting of the sperm and egg as a biological event, no less miraculous, but morally and qualitatively different from a living, breathing human life imbued with sacredness only when the mother or the parents deem it so. My job, as I see it, is not to encourage or to discourage women to have abortions, but rather to deploy my medical ex expertise in the service of their free choice, whatever that may be. And for their part, most women are relieved to be at last in this judgment-free zone, for they understand that they have made a decision with certain consequences, and having chosen at this juncture to terminate their pregnancy, most of them are able to live fully with that with the complexity of that choice. Sometimes the women are tearful as they look at me or at the sonogram picture, but as I learned a long time ago, tearfulness does not equal uncertainty. So as I see it, the desire to see the sonogram image is a cry of decisiveness. This is real. This is what I'm doing. This is what I want, having decided at this moment of my unique individual human life not to follow a different path. So it's later on when they're on the table and the weeks of pent up anxiety turns to relief, a floodgate now that the anticipation is over, that the women start to tell their stories. One woman says she was so sick with her first pregnancy that she had to be hospitalized. 
Now, the single mother of a nine-year-old son, she can't afford to be hospitalized again. Another plans to join the Army and is already arranging for it to leave two very young children in the care of her parents, signing papers that make them the custodian should something fatal happen to her in the line of duty. A third is following her husband's job to a big city up north and will need to resume a full-time corporate career to make ends meet. There's, re there's a recently divorced mother of three with a one-year-old child at home. There are athletes and dancers, uh, the, both eyeing, uh, with their eye on big dreams, the Olympics, Alvin Ailey even. There are women studying for degrees, hoping to become therapists, biologists, biologists teachers, nurses. But there are also drug addicts, sorority sisters, not to equate sorority sisters and drug addicts. <laughs> Uh, women in denial about fundamental truths in their lives, and women who consent to be in destructive relationships that are impossible to understand. On occasion, I may see the same woman twice in four months. Like all people everywhere, the women in these clinics are, for better or for worse, merely humans, doing the best they can, making this decision, having taken everything they can into account. But no matter what brought them here, they do not deserve to bear the brunt of a culture's historic and dysfunctional shame. I'm thinking now of a patient who sought to terminate her pregnancy because she was unmarried, though in a long-term relationship and the leader of a Christian youth group. Feeling that she could not, quote, model appropriate Christian behavior under these circumstances as a pregnant single Christian woman, she had an abortion instead. Now, I didn't say this to her at the time, but this is how I felt. How much better would it have been to work through her real life dilemma in an open and honest way for those kids that she taught and not to default to some rigid understanding of how Christian women ought to behave? A third of women in America have had abortions, but a fraction of them are brave enough to stand up and tell their stories. I've found that when women do share their experiences of abortion out loud and with one another and with the men in their lives, they do so much to push back the stigma and shame for themselves and for all women who feel silenced and blamed. So for me, I tried to give you a rich tapestry of who the women are. And if you were listening closely, if you really want to know who the women are who have abortions, all you have to do is take a look in the mirror because they look just like you and I. The second question, and this, this, the things that I'm sharing are, are guided by questions that I get frequently. The second thing is people want to know what kind of person does abortion? Why does a guy like you do the work that you do? How did you end up in this? And uh, let me kind of give you the prequel, the backstory um, of having uh, grown up in uh, the South and the belt buckle of the Bible Belt, in my opinion, Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, I was doing pretty well, and doing well in school and cruising along and went to medical school and had never been taught that abortion was wrong, but um, um, felt conflicted about what it meant to provide that care when I became a women's health provider. So I ultimately had to uh, come to a place that put me in a crisis of values that required me to do a deeper dive and a values clarification around what it meant to hold the identity as a women's health provider uh, and as a Christian and to be unable to provide one of the most essential services that women uh, need. And so I happened to be living in Hawaii, happened to be living in Hawaii. <laughs> Uh, as on the faculty of the University of Hawaii, and uh, life was pretty good, and I had no reason to disrupt that. And it was in the midst of living the good life that I found myself in a situation where uh, an administrator um, um, stopped us from providing abortion care for the women in our clinic. And so I had motored along and always lived in communities like in Merced, in a county where there were no abortion providers, and that wasn't the expectation. I didn't receive any abortion training. And, and during my residency, I saw one abortion. And so I also could default to say, well, you know, I, I can't do what I don't know how to do. And yet, increasingly, it was becoming uncomfortable for me to ref simply refer women on because I never blocked a woman. I just simply. Uh, felt conflicted about what it meant to provide the procedure. And so now I found myself 
in this clinic responsible for women's care and had to uh, decide what it meant uh, for me, what was I going to do in the face of this very important care being taken away from the women that I was responsible for. So this comes from uh, the chapter in the book called Conversion, and it's going to pretty much tell you my story. In retrospect, I had already deferred this moment for far too long. I had refused to perform abortions out of loyalty to my Christian identity, but I had evolved a great deal since my Christian conversion and other identities had long since grown up beside it. At 41, I was a Christian, yes, but I was also a doctor, a health care provider for poor women and a man who loves women, in partnership, in friendship, at work, and in my family. I didn't do abortions, but I had seen enough patients in my dozen years as an OBGYN and grown close to enough women in my life to know that all kinds of women sometimes find themselves pregnant and unable to or unwilling to raise a child. Sometimes these instances are so striking that it's impossible not to see abortion as a, a sort of palliative solution to psychic pain. Before coming to Hawaii, I had worked for three years as a government doctor in Merced, California with Debbie Josephs, I'm editorializing, <laughs> where there was a shortage of medical care and one day a young woman about 18 or 19 years old came into my office. She was alone having driven herself to the clinic from her home some 20 miles away. This woman had become pregnant through incest by her father, a very controlling, overbearing, and ironically religious man. She was Latina from a family of migrant workers raised in a community defined by patriarchal hierarchy. Because she was not a minor or a dependent, I had no legal duty to report this tragic situation. And I knew enough about rape to understand that involving law enforcement without her consent could make this woman's daily circumstances even worse. In an extreme sense, this woman was merely doing what was expected of her, which was to live in her father's house until she moved, ultimately, into her husband's house or from one man's house to another. In light of these facts, her bravery, that is, coming to me by herself and seeking my help, struck me as extraordinary. I referred her to the closest clinic I could, which was about 50 miles away. But I remember thinking that if I had the skills to do her abortion, I would have done it right then and there. Fast forward to now I'm in Hawaii sitting in my condo looking at the ocean. <laughs> now, my audio tape was by serendipity. I used to listen to tapes of inspirational speakers. Yes, tapes. That's how long ago it was. Uh, and on this particular day, I'd been listening to sermons by Dr. King. By separate serendipity, my audio collection, my audio tape collection was queued up that day to the I've Been to the Mountaintop, Dr. King's final sermon, which I had heard dozens, maybe hundreds of times. I could quote whole sections of it word for word from memory. For when people get caught up with that which is right and they're willing to sacrifice for it, he said, there's no stopping point short of victory. But on that afternoon, I was, as I wrestled with the fact that certain women were being denied the health care services that they sought because of someone else's idea of what they should do, I heard the sermon with new ears. As he nears the final rousing lines of the speech, let us rise up tonight with greater readiness. Dr. King recounts a story from the Gospels, one that every Christian knows by heart and one that I myself was taught in Sunday school. In the story of the Good Samaritan, a man is lying wounded and helpless on the Jericho Road, having been beaten up. He fell in with thieves, as Dr. King put it. Two men, a priest and a Levite, the first obligated to help others by vocation and the second with blood ties to the victim, bypassed the man, leaving him lying in the road. Finally, a Good Samaritan, a man with no professional or familial tie, got down from his beast and decided not to be compassionate by proxy as Dr. King put it. The Samaritan administered first aid and helped the man in need. Of the three, only the Samaritan was great, Jesus said in the sermon. In his sermon, Dr. King begins to speculate almost sardonically on the reasons the first two might have hurried past a man as wounded and as desperate as the traveler was. Maybe they were frantically busy or maybe they were late for a church meeting. Or maybe they were following a religious edict that required priests and Levites not to contaminate themselves by touching another human body in advance of a religious ritual. 
Or maybe they were devoted to a different, broader kind of civic assistance. Perhaps they had joined a committee to improve the safety of travelers, the Jericho Road Improvement Association, <laughs> as Dr. King put it. Maybe they felt it was better to deal with the problem from the causal root rather than to get bogged down with an individual effect. Outside my penthouse apartment, the sun was going down, and then Dr. King got to his point. It's possible that those men were afraid, he said. The Jericho Road is a dangerous road, and in Jesus' day, it was teeming with thieves. It's possible, Dr. King suggests, that the priests and the Levite were worrying first and foremost about their own skins and wished not to draw unwelcome attention or danger to themselves by dismounting from their animals or lingering over a person too disabled or to be quick in an emergency. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking, part of a scheme to lure unwitting, soft-hearted travelers into an ambush. The priest and the Levite passed the man because their first thought, Dr. King suggested, was fear for themselves. If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? What made the Good Samaritan good in Dr. King's interpretation was that he reversed the question of concern. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? It was like a punch all at once in my spiritual gut. The scripture came alive and it spoke to me. For the Samaritan, the person in need was a fallen traveler. For me, it was a pregnant woman. The, the earth spun and with it, this question turned on his head. It became not is it right for me as a Christian to perform abortions, but rather, is it right for me as a Christian to refuse to do them? And in that instant, I understood that I, like the Levite and the priest, had been afraid. Afraid of what my Christian brothers and sisters might think of me, of what my pastor and relatives in Birmingham might say, of what the social or political consequences of fully embracing the cause of abortion might be. I had been worried, if the truth be told, about tarnishing my stellar pro rep professional reputation. I was already speaking out on domestic violence and sexual assault. Wasn't that enough? My love for my cushy situation was fighting for its life against my conscience, <laughs> and my conscience prevailed. I'd erred too long on the side of caution, just as I did when in my senior year of college I declined to join a campus-wide protest against Berea's investments in South Africa, afraid that someone might develop a negative opinion about me and ruin my chances for medical school, a demoral I regret to this day. So for me, it really came down to, I became uncomfortable not providing abortion care when I knew what women faced. And I had to take a deep, hard look at my religious and faith tradition of Christianity the place where most of the opposition in this country is coming from, fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. And when I looked more closely at my faith tradition, I had to decide that most of us wear multiple identities. I, I can rattle off five of mine for you standing right here. I always say five and then I always forget one. <laughs> but I am male, black, heterosexual, Christian, and born in the West, right? But I will never be any one of those things more than I am a human being. I will never be more black than I am human, more male than I am human, more heterosexual. And if any of those identities compete with my humanity, I will reject them outright. So when it came to whether or not to hold on to my faith identity as a Christian, I had to take a closer look. And when I looked at the sacred text and looked at the content of Christianity with regard to abortion, I found that there was nothing at all in the sacred text about abortion. And what I ultimately came to conclude is like many things, the patriarchal control and oppression of women uh, in the expression of Christianity was merely patriarchal custom posited into religious understanding and therefore put beyond scrutiny. Howard Thurman, one of the theologians who influenced Dr. King greatly said that the things that are in religion that are true they are in religion because they are true. They are not true because they are in religion. That is to say that sometimes in order to control and to put things beyond scrutiny, we take things like the, the subordination of women, and the major way we do that is through uh, 
prohibiting them from controlling their reproduction. And we put it into our faith traditions and say that God said A, B, and C. And when I looked and I had to find that any expression of a God understanding that that doesn't that is that's that that can't say she as much as it says he is not an authentic expression of a God understanding in my opinion and I simply would not participate in an understanding that allowed me to subordinate over half of the human population so I became uncomfortable not providing uh, care for women uh, and so it made me willing to go against tradition uh, uh, because traditions will never be more important than people. The final thing that I want to read and share and then I'll open it up for questions is actually my favorite part of the book. It's my favorite chapter and uh, I'm going to read it to you in its entirety because it's very short but it allows me to do some deep critical thinking about this moment that we're in, especially because it, it, it applies a racial and a class analysis that uh, call, prompts us to question what the motive is about this uh, persistent effort to control the reproduction of women, and in particular, the reproduction of women of color and poor women. Because something didn't make sense to me for people to insist that poor women and women of color are, should continue pregnancies that they didn't want or that they were too sick to have, while at the same time cutting off the very resources that would be necessary for those women to raise those children with a modicum of dignity. And so something didn't add up, and I had to see, what's this really all about? So it prompted me to think about this whole argument about uh, abortion being black genocide. And so I call this chapter Black Genocide and the White Majority. So it's the spicy chapter. I'm going to read it to you in its entirety. And so uh, somebody once said, you can't awaken somebody's pretending to be asleep. So this is either a wake up call or I'm going to see if you're pretending to be asleep. <laughs> Nothing enrages me more than the anti's most recent strategic gambit, the black genocide movement. Launched in its current iteration in 2009 by white anti-abortion activists in Georgia, it is a craven and cynical effort to get black people to regard the clinical practice of abortion, as well as the whole abortion rights movement, as an assault by white America on blacks. Banking on the fact that 37% of the women who seek abortion in America are black, the black genocide movement positions Planned Parenthood as the main perpetrator of this genocide and the birth control pioneer Margaret Sanger as its primary architect. The black genocide movement is nothing more than a conspiracy theory, pretending that abortion is a white plot to kill black babies and that by raising this awareness in black communities, it is protecting millions of black lives from slaughter. As an African-American abortion provider who grew up in poverty, I take this accusation that I am complicit in this white plot very personally. It is true that because poor women and women of color have less access to reliable birth control and, and health care, that they are more likely than privileged women to have unplanned pregnancies. They are also less likely to have taken comprehensive sex education in school, and the conditions of their lives are often chaotic and unstable, which can lead to complex, less than socially acceptable decision making. They probably choose medication abortion less than privileged women, although good data here are hard to find, because they tend to make their abortion decisions at a later gestational age. These women, or black women, walk into abortion clinics more often than privileged women. Not necessarily because they don't want a child or another child for that matter, many of them do. But because the circumstances of their lives are constraining and prohibitive, women of all races and socioeconomic groups cite multiple reasons for seeking an abortion. Lack of, res lack of financial resources, relationship instability, more children at home. But this multiplicity of factors disproportionately afflict poor women and women of color. I see it all the time. The implication that in their effort to preserve their own sanity and resources and to save their own lives that these women are murderers makes me want to lash out like Jesus overthrowing the tables in the temple. The black genocide movement is a trumped up play to gain political advantage. 
Cynically disguised as civil rights, it targets the most vulnerable women and pits their pregnancy against their own self-interest. In doing so, the black genocide movement only serves to compound the misery of people who are already living in circumstances of pain and deprivation. I first saw the black genocide billboards on highways running through mainly African-American neighborhoods in Atlanta and New York, and I think they were even out here in the, in the, in the Bay Area in Oakland. One of them had a gigantic photograph of a beautiful African-American child. It said, black children are an endangered species. Another said, the most dangerous place for a black baby is in the womb. A third had a picture of President Barack Obama and read, every 21 minutes, our next possible leader is aborted. These signs play, prey on black women's traditional sense of responsibility to their community and imply that they have some kind of higher duty, higher than to themselves, to continue a pregnancy. In 2009, a white pro-life filmmaker named Mark Crutcher produced a documentary-style propaganda piece called Ma'afa 21, which equates abortion by black, black women to slavery and the eugenics experiments of the first half of the 20th century. Positioned as a civil rights film, it circulated widely amongst various African American groups. After it came out, I read an interview with a young, well-educated student at Morris Brown College in Atlanta who said that, having seen the movie, she now understood that there was a conspiracy to kill black people, implying that if she, that implying that she'd factored that line of reasoning into her decision-making process, should she ever find herself contemplating abortion. Now this young woman was on track to realize her hopes and dreams, and it anguished me deeply that based on these lies that she was willing to go off track, to risk poverty for herself and for a prospective child, which was precisely what the white purveyors of these lies had hoped that she would do. Now when I see a patient like this in one of the clinics where I work, and I sense that she's wavering based not on her own inner voice, but because of some propaganda that she's encountered somewhere, I try to rebuild her self-esteem and her dignity. I tell her that her decision to care for herself is not in conflict with any duty that she may or may not have to other people who look like her, and that the shame that she feels is a product of outside forces who want her to feel that way, not because people care about her, but because as a poor woman or a woman of color, she's an easy target. She can be made into an example to further someone else's agenda. I remind her that before she can ever help anyone else, that she must first help herself. I seldom see women who genuinely want to change their minds based on this propaganda. Most women are resolute. They are committed to their course of action. But they are distressed by the social pressures that they feel from such movements and such forces as the black genocide movement. I encourage these women to act on their own behalf and to feel the power of their own agency. The truth, I'm convinced, is that the people behind the black genocide movement, like Priests for Life and Life Dynamics, do not care about black babies or black women. These are often the same people who want to do away with public housing and who won't support state-sponsored child care. Theirs is a feigned concern. They are using women of color as pawns in a much bigger game. For what they understand, what for they understand what too few of the foot soldier, foot soldiers in the abortion debate do. In abortion politics, all women are sisters linked by their ability to bear children. If the antis can change the terms of the game and the debate by framing it as a systemic racism perpetrated by big healthcare institutions against black people, then they can change the laws around abortion and no one will intervene, not even the white women who need abortions too. Their goal, and I'm preaching now and I can't help it, is not actually to curtail abortion services for, the poor, for poor women and women of color. It is to limit access to abortion for all women, including and especially white women. Because the thing that all too many white anti-abortion activists really want, but they can't say out loud, is for white women to have more babies in order to push back against the browning of America. As we march towards the reality that by 2050, no one racial or ethnic group will hold a proportional majority in this country, racial suicide paranoia abounds. And for the white racist legislators in red states, like my home state of Alabama, nothing is more threatening than a majority brown country. 
It strips them of their historic power. The prospect of being outnumbered is what enabled the Tea Party to mutiny Congress in 2010 after the election of Barack Obama, America's first uh, black president. It allowed them to cripple the Republican establishment, and it allowed them to render the first major uh, party female presidential candidate powerless and to enable the, the rise of the racist, nationalistic, and misogynistic Donald Trump. Yes, I said it. Yes. Uh, the white people who are still in charge believe that if their women don't start having lots of babies, that they, the white patriarchs, are going to become obsolete. A hundred years ago, a white politician with this same fear who would hope to exert control over female fertility would have just said so. In his 1905 speech on American motherhood, Theodore Roosevelt encouraged white women to do their duty and to have at least two children or to contemplate race suicide. In these times, such a bald articulation of racist values is impossible, or at least it used to be. Too many of their own women, that is white women, are working and going to school, running businesses, running for political office, and taking birth control pills. Therefore, any outward pressure on their mothers, wives, daughters, or sisters to have more children would be risible. And so the white men in charge have invented a workaround. They've tied their antipathy towards abortion together with civil rights and the Black Lives Matter movement. They understand that by curtailing abortion for black women, they curtail it for white women too. It's a sleight of hand, a misdirection. The way I see it, the attack on abortion rights is nothing less than an effort to put all women back in their place. I like that chapter. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And what I like about it in particular is it helps me to make sense of this unique moment that we find ourselves in where there's the, the, uh, the conflation of fundamentalist evangelical Christian religion uh, with white supremacy and class uh, and Islamophobia to make, uh, it especially, the church, in my opinion, the papacy of empire. It, is, it lends a legitimacy and a sort of uh, manifest destiny uh, to create white uh, and Christian exceptionalism that allow our behaviors to be beyond scrutiny. Dr. King, at the end of his life, said the biggest criminals, the biggest war criminals in this country was the participation of the American government in the war on Vietnam. And, you know, when he started to call for a critical self-reflection and analysis of this country, and when he started to say, I love this country enough to criticize it, he became the most unpopular person in this country. He, his approval rating was lower than it ever was. And so now we've pedestalized and we've, uh, we've watered down Dr. King. We, we prefer the 63, I have a dream speech versus the radical Dr. King at the end of his life where he began to question if there was really a moral capacity by white people collectively to overthrow and to overcome racism. So we're at that moment now where we have to have a prophetic voice in this country. Um, and I say prophetic because I think uh, this is a moral issue, is a moral question, and we have to have a revolution of values. It can't be might makes right. It can't be one religious understanding over another. There's an intrinsic morality of what, how should human beings relate to each other and how should they relate to the planet and the distribution of the resources in a sustainable and equitable way. So those are more than rhetorical questions. Those are questions of strategy about once we're convinced that we're all innately worthy of the resources that allow us to live meaningfully, what are we prepared to do to secure those resources? And so I hope, uh, one, let me thank you for your attention and, uh, and affording me the privilege to read from my book. And uh, now, I personally am more interested in questions than answers. 
because I have more questions than I have answers. And so, uh, well, now we'll, uh, until they shut me down, I will uh, entertain questions and we can have a meaningful dialogue. So I'm going to allow the person with the mic to democratize opportunity because if I start pointing here, there, and everywhere, I might lose or miss somebody. And, and wait for the mic, please. Um, I just have a quick question. It really stood out to me that you said that you feel more like you're more of a human than you are African American or like yeah. black. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know at what point in your life did you discover that? Because I feel like every day there are like barriers put in place to remind me and African Americans that we are black mm -hmm. and that we have that we have these animal animalistic like um, characteristics. So I just wanted to know like when did you like. Sure discover that and how do you deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis sure. to constantly feel like yeah. you're a human being and not just African-American or male? Sure, sure. Um, uh, when, when I make that declaration, I make it in terms of two things. One, uh, that uh, the things that uh, the identities that I enumerated are uh, identities that are uh, uh, not essential to our humanity. And at the same time, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they serve as means of either uh, subordinating us or privileging us. And so when I became clear that the most essential defining characteristic for me is my humanity, uh, when I say that I'm more human than I am black, uh, it is not uh, as if there's a zero-sum game between my humanity and my blackness. And it is the assertion that uh, if you are standing outside of my blackness and you're seeking to subordinate it, uh, you can't subordinate me on the basis of my blackness because I'm more essentially defined by my humanity. And at the same time, uh, as Dr. King said, a doctrine of black supremacy is as toxic as a doctrine of white supremacy. And so for me, uh, in terms of being self-defining, it is my, my, my recognition of the various uh, uh, aspects of my self-identity uh, is my ability to put those uh, in, um, in, in priority around what is most essential to me. Uh, but, you know, it's not, it's not uh, a, you know, uh, um, when I say that there's one race and it's the human race, it is to say that the other aspects or descriptors of our race as a social construct, uh, there's nothing organic about race, but race is real, right? Race doesn't tell you anything about me intrinsically, but it can tell you an awful lot about what happens to somebody who looks like me. And so it is the understanding of these identities and understanding that I have them, uh, and that uh, I don't have to define myself by them in order to assert superiority, and I don't have to be defined by them in order to be subordinated. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Doctor, for coming to talk to us. I think everybody appreciated it. Thank you. You mentioned that you saw one abortion during your training earlier on. How and where did you acquire the skills to perform abortions now that you do it yeah. quite often? Uh, I was able to, uh, I gave uh, a medical talk at Stanford yesterday and I was able to visit with that doctor who is now on faculty at Stanford where I witnessed the one abortion when she was one of my trainers in residency. So uh, I um, trained about 25, 20, now it's almost 28 years ago. And it was at a time where it predated the whole the organization called Med Students for Choice or any significant effort to uh, reverse the graying effect of abortion providers. So I was able to go through my training without having any abortion training. And at that time, uh, people who were 
interested in being trained as abortion providers either sought out places where that training was incorporated and mainstreamed into the training like UCSF uh, or other places. Uh, and so then the, the, the acquisition of the training required you to opt in or to seek it out and to request it versus now we've sort of maneuvered people into the position to, uh, to regulate what is the content of core medical education competency. So now the expectation is that people finishing training will be trained in women's reproductive health care to include contraception and abortion care. So now you have to opt out. You almost have to be a conscientious objector. And you can't simply say, I, don't, I prefer not to do it. You have to establish that there's something fundamentally uh, incongruent with your value system that would allow you to not pursue training. And even then, you have to be exposed to the content. You, don't have, you just don't have to do the procedure. So I, uh, after 12 years of practice, uh, was able to go back uh, and pursue training uh, in abortion care at the University of Michigan. So I left Hawaii, uh, where the white stuff under my feet was sand, and moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the white stuff under my feet, on top of my feet, and up to my knees was snow. <laughs> But I think women were worth it. So I, now there's a post-graduate uh, training uh, that one can pursue. But now, even more importantly, the expectation is that starting at the medical student level that uh, uh, abortion and uh, contraception will be considered core competencies and people have to be exposed to that content. Yes, I heard uh, the manager yesterday, well, manager of Revolution Books say some time ago that you equated the women's movement with African Americans and slavery. Mm -hmm. How do you justify that when white women were not enslaved, they weren't lynched, and they weren't burned, the children weren't taken away from them? Secondly, how do you justify being part of a religion that has enslaved your people, and since everyone in here cares about women's rights, Every time Obama is mentioned, he's mentioned as the first black president, mm -hmm. when he's actually the first biracial president. Mm -hmm. His mother has been completely forgotten. Sure. Very, thank you for that question. Um, it, it, you're, you're calling for an analysis of the interplay of those various identities that I illuminated and said that uh, none of them are more important than my humanity. And so uh, in terms of... Uh, all religions have people in them, and so the corrupting influence isn't the religion, it is the fact that people who are complex individuals who have complex ways of processing reality and modulating the value systems that they subscribe to uh, means that uh, there, are, uh, there, are, um, there have been benefits wrought from religious understanding as well as harms, and Christianity, uh, uh, has been um, used in a mighty way to subordinate and to justify uh, Eurocentric colonization. Uh, but that's not unique to Christianity. And so uh, Christianity, for me, is the faith tradition that I choose to embrace because it's culturally what I, what I know. It also fits with the kind of... Uh, uh, moral analysis that is consistent with what I think uh, is more universal. And so uh, I don't leave Christianity rooted and anchored in the history of how we got it. And so uh, rather than feeling indicted by the fact that I embrace a tradition that has brought uh, tremendous harm uh, to the world, there have been other traditions that have done that, uh, rather than default to the notion that that religion is toxic, I, I choose to believe that religion is no more toxic than the people in it. And if the religion doesn't leave you with uh, a mechanism to be a better you, then you should probably abandon it. With regard to the drawing a, 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 an analogy between uh, uh, the enslavement of uh, forced motherhood being analogous to slavery, uh, I used the analysis of Dr. King when he, when he decided what he thought was the moral indictment against slavery, when he said that what made slavery immoral was it relegated people to the status of things. 
And so when captured Africans were brought to this country and their labor was stolen and uh, commodified for the benefit of other people, it's a question of means and ends. People should be ends and not means. And you can make yourself a means, but nobody else should be able to make you one. So when we uh, control the fertility of women and the processes that occur in their bodies, and we, uh, we decide that women, uh, for the purposes of pursuing hierarchical, patriarchal male power, are subordinated in the status of their being as women. We relegate them to the status of things, analogous to slavery, relegating Africans to the status of things. So women who don't control their fertility to become incubators. So in drawing that analogy, it is by no means to invoke, you know, we don't, we can't even approximate the horror and the humanity and the inhumanity of what slavery did to captured Africans. But I would argue in places where women are denied access to control of their bodies, the horrors and the injuries are no less heinous. So it's not a matter of comparing narratives of misery, it's a matter of, for, for the moral content and understanding by analogy, sometimes it seems to be beyond people to understand what the moral infraction is of denying women access to reproduction. And maybe to some degree, even though we can't fully understand the horror of slavery, I think it's a valid notion about the moral content being when you relegate people to the status of things, uh, whether it be in the process of slavery or in the process of enslaving women by forced reproduction, I think that it's an apt analogy. I have a question, um, and then I'll pass the mic more democratically. But you know, one thing that struck me um, in the book and in, in my introduction to you, I read, well, you work in these three different states, mm -hmm. right? And I just thought probably the audience should appreciate why. You know, why does this doctor, I mean, I go to doctors, I'm gonna go to one on Friday, I think of them as very privileged and you know, cushy human beings. Why is this doctor driving to three different states? What is, what is the actual situation, you know, down on the ground um, for access to abortion to, for women? Well, I've gotten a lot of credit for going home uh, to the South to practice, and I jokingly say I abandoned the Harriet Tubman model of abortion care. I used to live in the North, and I'd swoop down to the South, help a few folk, and go back. Um, but um, when it comes to abortion access in this country, I define the South the way Minister Malcolm X defined the South when he was once asked um, if he thought race relations were better in the North than they were in the South. He says, oh no, race relations are as bad up South as they are down South. <laughs> and the journalist perplexed asked him what he meant. And he says, well, when it comes to race relations in America, I define South as South of the Canadian border. <laughs> And so if you think about the fact that since, 20, uh, since uh, 2000, when there were approximately 13 states that had multiple barriers in place to uh, 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 prevent women from accessing abortion, uh, which would lead to those states as being deemed hostile, since 2010, there have been over 300 new uh, state-based regulations that have functionally gutted the provisions of Roe. So to now roughly 27 states, or over 50% of the states in this country are deemed hostile to reproductive rights and reproductive access. So what that means is there have been multiple barriers in place like tw uh, waiting periods as if women don't have the intellectual and moral clarity to decide when and whether or not to end a pregnancy. And in Alabama, it's 48 hour waiting period. In Mississippi, it's 24. In Louisiana, it's 72. And there's no reciprocity between states. So if you've waited 24 hours in Alabama, in, in Mississippi, and then you, you, you're, you're beyond the legal threshold, you have to now wait an additional 48 in Alabama if you go to that state to get it done. There are parental notification laws that require a minor who's pregnant and wants to seek an abortion to have to notify their parents. And there are judicial bypass processes in place in those states. There are uh, barriers to using public funding to pay for abortions for poor women. And so the, there's a multiplicity of forces at play, but what happens to be disproportionate is that those things are, uh, if some states have one or two, most states in the South have all of them. 
And so what that means is uh, women in the South have uh, a, a, a disproportionate burden in accessing what should be their constitutionally guaranteed rights to health and privacy. So what that means in layman's terms is that a person's ability to, to access abortion care depends on their zip code. It should, there should be no reason why a woman in, in California should have easier access to abortion than a woman in Jackson, Mississippi. So that the region of the country that I come from, Alabama, and its surrounding states have these laws in, 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 uh, in place. When I left Hawaii to acquire the skill to provide abortion, so that my ability to help would always supersede my willingness to help. It didn't make sense to me to upstage my life and to acquire the skill and then to fail to try and shape the context in which women can access those services. So me going around is a question of equity versus equality. Equity is uh, if shampoo is the issue uh, and we're going to distribute it, Jill Adams needs more shampoo than I do. So equity would mean Jill Adams gets more shampoo than I do. That's not a question of equality, right? Equality would say we got the same amount of shampoo. But equity says Jill gets what she needs, and then I get what I need, and I should not begrudge her shampoo because I don't really need any. Right? So women around the South, why I, you know, I could easily go back to Hawaii or practice here in California, but why? create a surplus of abortion access in California when there's no access in Mississippi. Yeah. I really appreciate a lot of the things that you said um, about um, the patriarchal structures that give rise to the situation that women are put in that is very disadvantaged. Uh, that it's to their disadvantage. Um, and especially to white supremacy, obviously that plays a huge role um, in the situation uh, that the women find themselves in that go to you. Um, I'm coming from a very different place. I am, I, I am a liberal, but I am an atheist. Mm -hmm. So I don't share your faith, but I also am a pro-life activist or anti-choice or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know, I know that you mentioned that 24 weeks is kind of your cutoff point where you feel like it's not really a person before that due to the brain waves and the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Would you say that an abortion performed at 25 weeks is totally morally not permissible and that one before that is like on par with birth control or just help me understand where you're coming from in terms of that? Well, uh, to draw a hard line is to, to deal with life uh, in a, it, at, as an absolute versus a series of contingent interrelational processes. Life is not an event, it's a process. And so to draw a hard line, there's no hard line metric. The, 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 the capacitating development of a fetus as it progresses doesn't on 21 weeks in one day, you have lung capacity, you don't. There, what that means is there are some 24-week fetuses that due to the range of development, if they weren't terminated, they might survive. Uh, and then there are some 27-week fetuses that aren't capacitated and they wouldn't survive, even though they've hit the milestone that we would say reaches development. So what I would say that governs my practice of my decision to honor the law, and I think that for whatever reason, and, and uh, with the decision, the road decision, that somehow they magically hit right around the, techno the, technolo the technologic limitations around what fetal development in terms of capacitating for a pregnancy being able to, to survive outside the womb. The road decision says that the state has a compelling interest to prevent a woman from actualizing her decision about whether to continue a pregnancy when uh, there's the possibility that that pregnancy can, decide, can survive outside the womb. For me, I choose to obey the law, but in terms of the process of moral reasoning, I have my own personal limitations around what feels like the appropriate use of my skill set. Now, for me, I 
I'm constantly revisiting, you know, to your point about why is 24 and 6 okay, but 25 and 1 not? You know, so my own uh, ethical tabs are wide, but they're not absent. So I have to struggle for the interface of it. What, it, what does it mean for me to actively engage in a process that I'm in the process of securing personal liberties for someone else whose values may not be the same as mine. So I can't give you a hard and fast and say why it's okay at 23 and six, but not at 24 and one. But what I can say is in terms of obeying the law and understanding that uh, based on developmental probabilities, when a pregnancy can't survive outside the womb uh, and that woman decides to end that pregnancy, for me, it falls in the domain of her bodily autonomy, her sovereignty and her integrity, and her decision to decide whether or not to become a mother. And that what I insist on is that we as a society have to divest of our notions about what the significance of, of an individual procreating has for the rest of us. Because if I can have more of an interest in your reproductive capabilities than you do, then you become public property, right? And so for me, again, the moral infraction there is when you become a thing and not a person, and I just feel like none of us have the right to, to, to put you in that space. So I, I hope that doesn't feel like uh, obfuscation to you, but I'm saying to you, for me, there's no Clear, you can't, it's, it's a process and it's an event. There are a lot of things that I weigh, right? Uh, the health of the mother, uh, the possibility of intact survival, the right of those parents who are modulating that decision. How much risk should a woman take given that there's an intrinsic risk to carrying a pregnancy? For example, we have a rising maternal mortality uh, rate in this country that the highest in the developing world the highest in Texas and Louisiana, and we are taking away services that allow women to avoid that risk because we're forcing them to stay pregnant because of the moral sensibilities of individuals that go beyond where we should have reach into another person's life. So I say, you know, if, uh, you know, I obey the law, I look, I put the whole picture together, and what feels to me like the respect of Fetuses have moral weight and women have moral weight, but a pregnancy can never be more important than the woman carrying it. Thank you. I, I, I was wondering if anyone here is, is a medical student or if anyone here was thinking of becoming an abortion doctor, just a curiosity. Yep. Yeah. Well, actually, um, Dr. Parker, your work was my inspiration to choose to be an OBGYN. I was always interested in women's health, and then one day I stumbled upon your Facebook page and an article about you, and I couldn't stop reading. It was just so inspirational to me, the work that you do, and how you go out and give these talks, and talk about how your past has inspired you to provide women with the medical care that they need, despite any kind of circumstance. And I actually had a question to ask as well. So an article I read recently talked about how the states that you practice in require you to give your patients medically inaccurate or untrue like propaganda about the abortion care they're there to receive. Can you talk about how you go around those laws to provide women with honest and accurate medical information? Sure. Well, the, uh, the beautiful thing about Medicine is the art and the science of medicine, right? And the art part is that I'm required in the art of uh, diagnostic skills uh, to interpret medical literature and to give patients interpretations of medical literature based on my best medical opinion. So while through the letter of the law, uh, uh, ideologues can legislate into regulation the requirement that, for example, in Mississippi, that I have to tell a woman that having an abortion increase her risk for breast cancer. Um, 
I have to, in fact, say those words to her, but I can then say in my best medical opinion that this information is bogus and that it is not founded in legitimate medical science, and they can't stop me from saying that. So I exploit the fact that I have gained trust with uh, the, the person sitting in front of me uh, to be able to say, okay, here's what I'm required to tell you, but here's what I believe it, and I think is important for you to know. And to the degree that she trusts me, that um, they, the, to that degree, they cannot uh, impose or interpose in the uh, in the therapeutic relationship of the provider and the and the patient. So I just straight up say, you know, this is what I'm required to tell you. But in my best medical opinion, that's bogus. I think this cat's had his hand up for a while. Okay. Uh, doctor, you, um, you touched on rape and on the current political situation. And it just strikes me that with the current exposure of all of these men, prominent men, who can't, frankly can't keep their dick in their pants, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really imp imperative, we're talking about women's rights, that women also have the right not to be raped and not Absolutely. to be forced into the situation where they have, have to choose, you know, like that that's some like grand thing that, that they get to choose. You know, it's after the fact and uh, I don't know, I, it just seems like uh, in, a, in, a, in, in the violent society that we find yourself in, to try to like downplay um, you know, the, the, the sexual uh, violence on women is particularly, you know, nasty. Well, you're absolutely right, and you highlight why for me it's important to uh, uh, raise awareness to people that, just like we live in a racist society, we live in a rape culture, we live in a homophobic society, and I would argue that most of us are not rapists, most of us are not racist, and most of us are not homophobic. We're simply non-homophobic, non-racist, and non-rapist. And because those things are institutionalized, nothing changes. So what becomes important is for those of us who, have, who care about these issues, we have to become anti-rapist, anti-homophobic, anti-sexist. And what that means is you have to actively deconstruct the institutionalized maladies that allow these things to persist if you do nothing. So as a non-rapist, I sleep very well at night, right? But if I don't do anything to, to deconstruct rape culture, women and, and men, I've, I did sexual assault work in Hawaii. I examined men and women because rape is a crime of aggression perpetrated sexually, right? And so none of us are beyond the ability to be raped and yet we live in a culture where we uh, allow that to be the case. So I think what's gonna be necessary, uh, rather than mea culpas from folk or saying, I'm so sorry that this happened to you, is what are we gonna do to actively deconstruct rape culture? And the first thing we have to do is act, acknowledge that we live in one. And, uh, and you know, as, like I said, you know, for people who come to me, if someone makes a, makes a racist statement to me, and for someone who comes to me after the fact and says, dude, that was so messed up what he just said to you. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Well, I don't really want to hear any private support, right? If you couldn't address it and stand up and, you know, you can keep it. Don't get me, don't ask me to lick your wounds because you are now feeling guilty that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So what that means is that we all have to really do a, a, a values clarification and say, what kind of world do I want to live in? You know, And then we have to do our part to deconstruct that culture. But it's a, simply a matter of how we remediate what you're talking about is, is we have to move from being simply non-rapist to anti-rapist and do what we need to do to bring that about. I think there's a few more questions. Is that okay? Uh, you I'll still... keep, I'll, I'll keep, as long as, the bar, <laughs> as long as the bar gets me back to the bay by midnight, I'm good. Um, thank you. Um, so 
when you were reading from the book, I was riveted to the section about being in Hawaii up in the penthouse. And, uh, and um, you know, and what struck me was that even, you know, when I was, you know, saying some, some words about you that I identified you as a hero, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And even as I think of you and I learn more about what you've done and you read from it, it you become really this larger than life presence, right, mm. in, in, a, in a way. And, you know, lit, literally your life is in danger. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not for show to escort you in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to be afraid that people will come in here is not uh, unfounded or right. hysterical. You, the, what you have done is to put yourself squarely in the crosshairs of an increasingly... Um, violent white supremacist um, Mm -hmm. society, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I struggle with as an organizer, right? I'm an organizer, like I said, um, for Refuse Fascism. We we bring people out in the streets. We do demonstrations. We are trying actively to get people to recognize that this isn't someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. And I notice that, like, people will say to me, my friends will say, well, you know, thank you for doing what you do. Mm -hmm. And I notice that, you know, I'm, I'm here, thank you for doing what you do. Um, and, but the, the solution, and it's tied to what you just shared, isn't that we all thank you mm-hmm. um, for, for standing up here and, and being this model to me of what a human is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that we all take that step. Right. Um, that we all put ourselves. Um, we might not all be in a, in, a, in a condo in Hawaii, but we're going right. along with our life as usual, right. and we have all the risks and things that we don't want to give up or challenges we right. don't want to face and in, in, in putting ourselves into this struggle. Um, so my, my question is for you, to, for all of us here, right? Um, what is that? What is that, that, that question? Um, how do we make that burn within ourselves to where we don't look around at somebody else to do it, where we decide we're going to have to step up? Sure. Well, um, I'm not a nosy person, but I was sitting next to somebody on the on, on the plane, and her book uh, it looked like it was like an organizational development book. And when I looked in the book, this this phrase caught me, and I just couldn't let it go. And and it simply said that nobody can do everything, and everybody can do something. And so it's the tension for us all is between that question of you know, there are some things that may be beyond your ability to do, but uh, it's a dereliction of duty to fail to realize that you can do something. And the thing, um, that thing that burns in me was, is in part, uh, uh, people ask about, am I afraid that somebody's gonna harm me? Somebody said, you can't be brave unless you're scared. And so, you know, it's my ability. I'd have to be dumb not to understand that, like you said, that there are people who uh, could harm me. You know, I, I jokingly say that the wildebeest on the cross in the Serengeti that loses its fear of the lion becomes lunch, right? And so when, when these people tell me what, they, what somebody ought to do to me, uh, and they're clever enough not to say what they would do to me because that's a direct threat. But they, they veiled somebody ought to shoot you in the head. Maya Angelou says when, when people tell you who they are, believe them. But for me, it's more a question. It's not a question of whether or not I'm afraid. It's what I'm afraid of. And for me, I'm, a, I'm afraid of, of living a life without meaning and without purpose. I know what that feels like because that's what happened when I failed to participate in what I knew was right with regard to divesting in South Africa because I put my thought that it might compromise my ability to get into medical school ahead of what I knew in my gut and my conscience was right. And so the thing that burns for me is is, uh, having found the thing for me that I live for so fully that I'm not paying attention to the fact that somebody might try and harm me for it. I think Dr. King said it best. He says, you know, if you haven't found something that you live for deeply, you're not fit to live. He said, you can, you know, if you can live to be 100, but if at 35, that thing that should define you, you are too afraid to embrace it, you may live another 65 years, but when you start breathing and your heart stops beating, it's a belated announcement of something that happened a long time earlier. 
And so I'm more afraid of a death of spirit than that somebody might try and harm me. And I think that thing for me is that thing that I can't abide. So when you say hero, you know, I say, somebody said that we praise, we praise our dead heroes and we criticize our living nonconformists, <laughs> right? So I'm a maladjusted nonconformist, <laughs> right? Because heroes get plaques on the wall and I'm trying not to have a plaque in revolution books on the wall. Sorry about God rest the dead. I'm not interested in that. Um, so how many more questions are there? Have them number off and then, <laughs> just have them number off and then we can go that way. I mean, one thing I'm just concerned with is just to leave enough time um, for uh, people to get Dr. Parker's book and for him to sign it and for you to have, you know, a moment, you know, to exchange with him. So how many people really need to ask a question and have something important to contribute at this point? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, one of, is this working? I think it's I working. generally don't need a mic either, sure. yeah. um, but I will use it. Oh. What struck me uh, very deeply, because I struggled with this, was when you mentioned equity versus mm -hmm. equality. And here in California, particularly the Bay Area, we are spoiled. We you know, have an overabundance mm -hmm. of people who, on at least you know, some part of the spectrum, agree with us. Mm -hmm. And we have access to resources when I first moved here in 1979, I found myself pregnant three and a half weeks after I got here. I was homeless, living in a tent on the mountain across the bay. I had no job, no money. I had a car. That was it. And I was able to go to Planned Parenthood, and they directed me to the Medi-Cal office. And within 47 seconds, I had emergency Medi-Cal, uh, was provided with an abortion that didn't go quite well, ended up at UCSF where they saved my life, and I didn't have to pay a nickel. I didn't have to feel shame. I could feel supported by perfect strangers, and they were perfect in that moment. Mm -hmm. The women that you're serving have none of that. They may have one one hundredth of it, and that likely comes from you, so it's not even from the place they're coming from. And I was struggling with that when I first stumbled upon you and the uh, Women's Reproductive Health Center in Montgomery through articles. And I found serendipity comes into play when you're struggling with these questions. And in the article that I was reading about you and that health center was a minuscule reference to how women who show up for your help pay for that service because these are not nonprofit clinics for the most part. They have to raise money to be able to perform uh, the services. And the National Network of Abortion Funds, which I had been doing reproductive rights work since 1973, when it became legal in New York, where I grew up. And I had never heard of anything like this. And I immediately donated money to it, because that was the thing I could do mm -hmm. from California. Mm -hmm. I could reach across 3,000 miles and obviously make myself feel better by taking that act, but I could actually reach out and help create that sense of equity mm -hmm. for people that I don't know. And the, when I did that, the woman who was the director of it immediately responded, like, how do you even know about us and why are you doing this from California? Because it was different for her to have somebody to reach out. So I'm gonna do a little PSA here for the National Network of Abortion Funds who help women primarily across the South, where there's a complete absence of available money to help women. Um, we can do that from here. We can share our resources, whether it's $5 or $500 or anything in between. Um, and it, it helps me sleep better at night out here in a land of you know, richness. Sure. Um, so I, just, I encourage people. That those are the kinds of things we can do right. without having to completely leave our condos in right. the sky. The, um, I, there's an abortion fund, the Willie Parker 
abortion fund through the National Network of Abortion Funds. And that the funds that go directly to that are specifically for women in Alabama and Mississippi. So if you have one, you should investigate a local abortion fund uh, and support. But if you have a particular burden or passion about women in the South, one aspect would be the uh, Willie Parker Abortion Fund for women in Alabama and Mississippi. Thank you so much sure. for coming out speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to, quick question. When you did not divest, did that in fact help you get into medical school um, when you were in South Africa? Oh, no, I wasn't in South So I was a college student at Berea College in Kentucky. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, turn the mic. I was a college student at <laughs> oh, Berea okay. College in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. and. Our school had a legacy of educating, uh, providing education for the descendants of slaves as well as mountain youth, but it had an, a, 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 an extremely large endow endowment and many, many institutions in this country were invested in South Africa. And I found an irony that this school that was committed to interracial education and education of black people, mm -hmm. the funding and the capacity to do that was funded by the exploitative system of mm -hmm. apartheid and uh, exorbitant returns on investments in South Africa mm -hmm. propping up that racial inequality. And so uh, um, it was my personal risk aversion to what I felt like, you know, I can't do the right thing because it might cost me something. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, 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 a low stakes lesson for me to learn what it feels like mm -hmm. when you don't live from your core. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think I have the courage to live in that space. And so it was a low mm -hmm. tuition for a priceless lesson. Mm -hmm. no, I have more things oh, to say. Because I'd like to question the notion that if you do not, you know, change your life course, you are experiencing almost a permanent death of spirit. I have strong faith that it keeps coming back to you and you can choose to take it back anytime mm -hmm. in your body and then you come back to life and you go and then almost like the signals and the um, roadmap of your destiny or who you want to be come back on and so you can hop right on it because if if I believe that if I don't do, for example, I just missed um, a choice on the street as we were walking up of something I could have done to open up this wonderful window, and I did not do it because I was like, oh, I'm tired, excuses, excuses. But I believe that window is coming back because if I believe that it wasn't going to, then I would deflate very quickly and give up. I, I, I hope it, I know what is heard is more important than what is said. And, and what I, uh, I'm sorry that what you heard is, uh, I wasn't speaking in absolutist terms. Like when you, uh, what, I was, what I was trying to convey is what, what happens to you over a period of time when you can intentionally ignore the sense of responsibility and the call to compassion. And no, you know, the whole notion of love and charity is something that you have to give willingly. I'm not implying that you have a duty to anybody primarily than other yourself, but the world works best. We're caught up in, Dr. King says, 
a, a, a network of a mutual destiny. And so what I was intimating is that in that particular moment, for me, what was injurious was that I knowingly compromised. And it was, it was for me, probably nothing would have happened. Uh, but for that person who's in need, like the whole, the whole, the narrative of the, the people who passed by the fallen traveler and said, what will happen to me if I stop to help? The ability to reverse the question of concern is one that is more universally beneficial. But the only person who gets to monitor whether or not what that means for you is you. So nobody says, so for example, in some states, you can put MD on your license plate. And if you drive by a, a, an accident and there's a notification that you had that on your plate but you didn't stop to help, you can be held accountable mm -hmm. for somebody witnessing that. But what I'm saying is the, the metric about what puts you in a crisis of conscience is internal. And so what it meant for me to feel what it means, what it feels like when when I don't do for me what I know feels to be right, mm -hmm. it's not that there's this series of uh, quantitative cosmic opportunities to weigh in in the universe. Mm -hmm. There are, in perpetuity, there are always, the time is always ripe to do right, according to Dr. King. Okay. So <laughs> what I hope you heard me say is, yes. there's a point at which you can ignore that voice so that you won't hear it anymore, mm -hmm. right? And then you will become, in my opinion, at least with regard to your ability to help others, morally inert. And so you will not become a conduit for grace and compassion to other folks if you ignore that impulse to help. But you know, the metric about how much and when and who is internal. Mm. I hope that clarifies a little yes, bit. Yes, that does. Okay. Thank you so sure. much. Sure. I just have a little quick uh, story. Um, when I was a year old, my mother, she had cancer of the uterus, and I was born in 79, so if you rewind back that far, um, she had like five doctors tell her that if she didn't have an abortion, mm -hmm. that by the time the baby, she was full mm -hmm. pregnant, mm -hmm. that um, she would be ate up with cancer. Mm -hmm. And so she had to decide mm -hmm. to have an abortion or not have an abortion and run a risk of dying and leaving me and my brother behind. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the hardest things for her she ever had to do in her life. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm older and we're close, um, uh, you know, we've had many discussions about it every year of that date. And that's been always really hard on her. You know, mm -hmm. this child would be a year younger than me. And one of the hardest things for her was as her, as her mother was dying, her older sister, who was a Bible thumper, mm -hmm. um, screamed at her, you're going to hell for having an abortion, you know, as her mother was taking her last breath. That was a really hard thing for my mother. And um, she still, you know, I'm from Mississippi, um, and she's, you know, still conflicted sometimes. Sure. And I've told her before, Mama, you're not going to hell. I mean, you know, you had five doctors tell you that you had to have an abortion. You had to, it's not, you know? And so I'm glad that, that we have doctors that, that can perform them mm -hmm. because otherwise I wouldn't have a mother, yeah. you know? And I just want to thank you. I'm completely new to all of this and your book. I haven't got a chance to read it, but I want to thank you. And I hope my story was helpful in some kind of way. At least I feel better <laughs> sharing that. And um, yeah, so from a medical standpoint, I thank you. Thank you. Your words remind me of the, the, the wisdom, Jewish wisdom of there's a saying by Rabbi Sofer said that no woman is required to build the world by sacrificing herself. And so the notion that the most primary duty of any woman when she becomes pregnant is to become a mother, again, is one that reduces a woman to the status of a thing and not a person. And so I'm glad your mother found the personal resolve to think about it, it, what she did was not uncommon. Many women who have abortions already have children. 
And your mother had to think about, you know, I want to be around to raise the two that I already have versus, you know, embracing this theoretical child that I might die in the process of trying to support. Absolutely. Right, right. Right. So you oh. talk to your mother, right. Thanks for giving your mother permission to take care of herself. Yes, yes. Um, last question. Um, th thank you, Dr. Parker, um, for everything that you're doing, for going down to Mississippi and Alabama. I, I myself, one of the first political things I did was go down and defend the Pink House, the last abortion clinic in Mississippi and Jackson thank from you. A, a horde of, you know, Bible thumping Christian fascists, you know, not all Christians are fascists, but some right. <laughs> Christians are If the shoe are don't fit, we don't try it on. It's all good. Was that? Right. <laughs> um, but uh, what I was going to say is, um, you know, this, this has been going, that speaks, this is about 10 years ago when I was down in Jackson, and yeah. this, this has been going on for a while. In the 90s, you know, there was a bunch of abortion clinics that were being bombed and doctors mm -hmm. that were killed and under Obama, Dr. T you got the award for Dr. Tiller. If people right. don't know, this was a doctor in Kansas, I believe, that was right. murdered. Right. Um, and you know, these people have been terrorizing uh, abortion doctors and women as they enter the clinics. And state after state has been passing all these horrendous laws for I don't know how long that's been going on for at least five or six years or something. Um, and but but now we're in a in a different situation with with. Trump and Pence and Jeff Sessions and you know a whole Betsy DeVos and a whole regime full of Christian fundamentalist lunatics that you know I mean Trump said during his campaign women should be punished for having abortions. Je Mike Pence, his home state of Indiana, is uh, they had a woman Pervy Patel in prison for having a miscarriage. I'm not right. sure if she's still in prison. So I, you know this this whole issue. I wanted you to speak. How you know how you're looking at the current situation, um, and also you know I do feel that this point that you keep returning to about the crisis of consciousness and what does it mean if we don't act, if we don't, what happens to our humanity if we allow the you know Muslims to be rounded up and the immigrants, 800,000 DACA kids, and the nuclear war against Korea, but. John Kelly says, you know, it's, on, it's only, or Lindsey Graham says, it's only going to be over there that people are killed. You know, what, hap what happens to our humanity now, and are, are we in a, I feel like we're in a, this is a leading question, but I feel like we're in a good German moment, you know, where all those people in Germany sat on the sidelines and watched their Jewish neighbors be rounded up. And anyway, how are you looking at the current situation? That's basically my question. Well, uh, I can't remember who said it. Someone said that, all that's necessary for evil to thrive is for good people to do nothing, yeah. right? And so, you know, I think we're at a we're at a moment uh, of a defining moment where uh, we, uh, as a as individuals, have to collectively come together to make a critical mass of good. And I think, you know, uh, Dr. King preached a sermon called The Drum Major Instinct. He said, we all should have a quest for moral excellence and, and purpose. And he says, there's a point at which we have to become comfortable with the process of self-nomination, especially when it comes in the pursuit of civil, just, civil, civil rights, moral, morality, and justice. When it comes to these issues that you enumerate, uh, when, when it comes to you have to ask yourself, if not now, when? If not me, who? And those questions about what, what must I do, uh, those are questions that we each have to ask. And part of that, to, to, to know is to become responsible. That's in my opinion. So uh, Maya Angelou said, when you know better, do better. And so we need to do consciousness raising, right? We cannot turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to, you know, the war drums that are being beaten. And, you know, we cannot allow ourselves to be lied to. Uh, there's no way to conduct a nuclear war regionally, right? Uh, and so 
I think uh, we have to become process, comfortable with the process of self-nomination when we, when we educate ourselves. Somebody said education makes people easy to lead but hard to drive. So when are we going to stop allowing ourselves to be driven at, by facilitating that process by choosing to remain uneducated about the issues of our day? So, you know, uh, in, in the spirit of the leading question, the answer is yes. So I think they're telling us we ain't got to go home, but we're going to have to get out of here. So I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, if anybody uh, purchased the book, I'm happy to sign it. But thank you for being here tonight. And uh, let's go forward. Uh, you know, it's great to come together and have a talk. But hopefully you've heard something to, uh, to encourage you to become activists. And, uh, you know, I found my cause, and I hope you find yours. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much.